is the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany Business Consulting and your host for today. I am so delighted to have you in the studio. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. Now let's get it started. Hey guys, welcome to the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany and the host of the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. We have in the studio today, Henry Wong, the brand guy. <laughs> hey, Henry, how are you? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. I'd like to jump right into it. So, Henry, do me a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself, why you do what you do, and what you love. Yeah. So, I run a branding consultancy um, agency called View here in uh, Toronto, Canada, and I primarily work with companies that seek to have an impact on, on the world. Uh, along the way, I guess, uh, in spite of my boyish looks, I somehow I have uh, managed to accumulate many years in the business. So I, I am now author of a book called uh, Telling Your Story, uh, which is really a, a guideline to exacting your brand in the marketplace, whether you're a person or a uh, product or service. Uh, but focus a lot these days on people, of course. So uh, that's is wonderfully why I like to, uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I, I don't, I don't hear that a lot. Um, you know, where, where we talk about the connection with, with branded people, what, what do you mean? What should we glean from that? Yeah, I know a lot of people tend to, uh, think, you know, I have to work on my brand, you know, so they uh, believe that simply is just getting out there, getting known in that, but really it's much yeah. more than that. It, it is very much like a product or a service out in the marketplace you're trying to establish a position and meaning to people and what i hope to do and what i've been sharing with people is the manner by which you can do that and that's often uh, just relying on the power of your story to be able to get that position and your brand out in the marketplace oh cool 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 you know i i, I would have to admit you know that's something I, I i've been thinking about you know in the past a uh, couple of years, you know, what, what is my brand? How do, how do I show up? And um, that's, that's really interesting. What got you into branding? You know, I think it had a lot to do with uh, just not being maybe able to do <laughs> other things in life. Uh, no, I just seem to gravitate a lot towards the uh, creative side of uh, marketing. So for many years, I was a creative director and brand strategist for a lot of uh, major ad agencies. And uh, about six, seven years ago, I decided to go off uh, on my own and, and only focus uh, purely on impact companies. And along the way, uh, what I found was that there were many individuals who were looking to build their brand at the same time. Because uh, upstarts, particularly uh, companies that are uh, founder based, often have the founder and the company's brand intertwined. So there's a wonderful bit of magic that begins to happen. And when they begin sharing their story, amazing things begin happening in that people want to connect with them. They want to understand a lot more of what they're all about. And more importantly, they come along for this mission and this ride that they've created. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so they're looking, they're looking at their brand from, I guess, the way they're showing up. Does, does their brand align with, you know, perhaps like their personal beliefs? Like, does it help them, you know, maybe articulate or, or give them permission to be that person or do they create alternate brands for, you know, facing the public? How, how does all that work? You know, I think the best brands are the ones that are true to the core that, you know, what these days we call being authentic. And we see this a lot with, uh, um, you know, performers, actors, or even politicians who I have helped at, where they try to manifest a type of persona out in the marketplace. What happens yeah. often is that uh, the real person may not connect properly with that, or they get found out, or they, you know, their true colors begin showing, and you really can't sell the public on that. The best thing for you to always do is to be authentic to yourself, to be, be true to yourself, so that you can bring that out. And, and so, my, my approach and my belief is that don't you don't manufacture it. You say, you find the best part of what you have and bring that to life. Okay. Okay. Cool. Got it. Got it. Got it. How interesting. It was, um, you know, just thinking about it from like a, like a public speaking perspective or, or something like that. Um, the idea of being authentic, I mean, it, it just makes it perfect. And then the brand, I guess, working with you helps tell that story, you know, so as I'm exactly. creating a bio or, 
Okay, cool. What, what is that process like? Actually, very thorough. So um, in, in the book, it actually uh, outlines a step-by-step approach, which is really t- first taking stock of who you are and yourself. If you were yeah. a product and, and working with me in my agency, we'd be doing consumer research, for example. We'd get poll studies. We would uh, speak to people. With people brands, it's not as um, uh, deep that way, but it's not that difficult for a person to run on their own, meaning you have a sense of who you are and you could do personality tests, for example, or or ways of assessing who you are as an individual. You get input from your friends and colleagues, and that gives another dimension. You have, um, you know, maybe reports from employers and so forth. All of that begins to form a a picture of who who you are. Ultimately, what you're looking to do is to try to find a unique position in the marketplace. Like, you know, through all of that, you're determining well, what makes me unique, what makes me different amongst everything else. And once you have that, you begin to understand a little bit of who you are and uh, tracing back to how you got there. You have some of the building blocks of a story of how who you are and what perhaps drives you. One of the most important things that we do is to help understand your purpose and your mission, uh, whether it's in life or the reason why you've started the company or the reason why you exist in the uh, uh, you know job marketplace. Through that, that all becomes intertwined and ties together and you find a way of interestingly uh, a way to present it. Uh, and, and everybody has this in, in itself. Uh, like you do this wonderful mm-hmm. podcast, Rick, you know, how, do, how you know, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit on you. Where did you get started and how did this come about for you? Uh, the podcast itself or kind of my purpose? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and your purpose and your advisory and, and consulting and so forth. For sure, for sure. Well, f- for me, you know, I, I saw I saw a specific problem. So I looked at it from the people perspective. I, I have a passion for um, seeing people being able to be, you know, self-sufficient at whatever level, you know, so that looks like, you know, a job that looks like starting a company or, or whatever it is. And then looking at the top, you know, the people that create jobs, you know, those are the, those are the people that um, are probably the diamonds. Those are the people that are best for me, you know, to be able to help. You know, my mission, and I went through with this whole uh, mission exercise, I don't know, 20 years ago, something like that. And and what came out of that is I'm really interested in educating, inspiring, and equipping people to pursue extraordinary goals or the way that I say, build extraordinary companies. And so our pal really is a platform for that. So I bring people on like you to help inspire people and to give people more tools and and that sort of thing. So that, you know, being an entrepreneur, being a CEO, running a company is a very lonely business, you know, but, um, you know, talking to other professionals and getting other information in, you know, just kind of makes the world, hopefully makes the world a little bit smaller. And you you summed it up really well. And through uh, what you were saying, I heard the word help maybe three times. And that to me uh, is probably your driving force in many ways. You're, You're really genuinely driven by this, desire to help people. And that in a way becomes your mission. And so we do this a little bit of an exercise with people to really under, you know, understand what drives them. For everybody, it's a little bit different. It could be money. It could be uh, bettering the world. It could be a better mousetrap, for example. In, in yeah. itself, there's often something that drives that founder to uh, success. And, you know, your desire, for example, seems to be to, to help people. And that's a wonderful way to drive your business. So through that, you know, we begin to look at how we bring that to life. So you look for stories and examples of how that ha- has maybe manifested itself. And then that becomes, again, those building blocks for what your brand becomes. And from there, and only then do you, you know, when you figure out those sort of magic words, then you begin to create the brand itself, whether it's a logo, whether it's, uh, you know, taking it to social media, a certain uh, sort of uh, conceptual advertising and on and on like that. But the, the yeah. work begins at the beginning, of course, to get to it. I think I think for me, you know, mission has always been mission, purpose, um, mm-hmm. meaning have always been important to me because, you know, when things got tough, you know, when I couldn't necessarily see that end or I wanted to, um, you know, do something different. It was just like, okay, why are we here? You know, yeah. and it really helped me to, to, to recenter myself. So, um, and it keeps I, driving I, you, no doubt. Yeah. 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 What, what, what I find, about you? Uh, 
Well, you know, my, myself, it, it really is uh, very aligned with uh, what you're all about, Rick, and that, that is uh, trying to find ways to help the world and help, help better things. And, and that's why it, it really is only the companies that want to have a positive effect on society that I work with. So I, I have uh, uh, food uh, companies that I work with, um, um, you know, cybersecurity companies, uh, uh, people who want to, you know, enter into politics or all sorts of things. And, and when that, those missions align, it's uh, really quite magical because then you, you really understand each other and you understand how to uh, maybe uh, drive them forward. But being very clear on that purpose that you're talking about is fundamental to, I think, a company's success. Because in the beginning, it really is a, a, a bit of loneliness, isn't it? You have your idea and you're running the company and you may have a few employees. How do you get other people on board and how do you get them to, to work? And, and the, the ones that and we've seen this in recent history, how just having this wonderful purpose can bring people aboard. And it's often what drives uh, nonprofits, of course, you know, to keep people motivated, they're going towards a common purpose. That can be applied in the profit world, of course, because often you have a purpose and when people align with that, then that, that's where the power really begins to happen. Um, it, when they don't, and, and you see this as well, when the uh, purposes are crossed, uh, then there's a little bit of discomfort, as you can see, and they're often not right for the job or they're not the right people or not the right customers and, and so forth. And many founders find this uh, to be true in the end. It's sometimes better to be, you know, the right thing to the right people rather than everything to everyone, because you can't, in the end, please everybody. There's just too many people <laughs> in the world, as we can see. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's and there's other people, you know, that, you know, might be a better fit. That's something, you know, I've always believed that we should be very transparent about. You know, when we're hiring people, you know, this is what we do. This is why we exist. When we're um, talking to clients, you know, we're looking for people, for companies really that have, you know, some sort of mission. You know, a lot of times for us, you know, it's just like, you know, do they believe in their people? Are they developing their people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I love working with people that are, you know, that want to change the world, that want to do things differently. But, you know, it's it's really, I think my belief around business is is really it's, it's a com communal effort you know, to deliver some product, service, you know, whatever it is to to a target market. And so um, it goes back to help. You know, like you said, you know, if we can help on multiple levels, you know, we've, we've done what we came to do. Yeah. So I love that. I, I, I'm often reminded of that wonderful proverb, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome. And so many, I, I see this as well with many of the companies I advise. They often hire based on a skill set or, you know, here's a set of criteria and it seems to match the resume, seems to match what I'm looking for. And they have those yeah. wonderful years in the trenches of being an XYZ company. But uh, yeah. the ones that uh, really uh, do well, I find, are the ones that connect on that fundamental belief system, as, you, as you've uh, outlined. And when that happens, then um, you, you can always add skills to people. You could always train them, but to get them to see what you're all about, it, it's, it's, it's something that has to be almost inherent, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How do you, how do you reinforce that, you know, in a company? I mean, your, your company, you know, one of the conversations we had recently is, you know, you've got your founder, your, you know, the company starts to grow, it gets more complex, you know, and that initial mission or whatever, you know, if it's not intentionally, um, worked on it's you know it can it can get diluted i mean how, how do you avoid that and, and i mean you work with larger companies i mean how do you how do you reinstall reinstall that if that's the case yeah i mean the you know the simple exercise as many of us have done is to ensure that there's uh, company values that are shared you articulate it you list it you sometimes put it on the wall you hand it out to people but it doesn't yeah. really mean anything if people don't fundamentally believe it. So you could have these words, but uh, it's really living and breathing it. And it does come from the top. You know, it's not do as I say. It truly is do as I do. Uh, so yeah. if you live and breathe it and you reinforce it, you use those decisions to uh, base uh, your business and, and people, people respond to it. For my own example, I get sometimes notoriously known for uh, maybe firing clients, you know? and it's not that I don't get along with them, but sometimes they, they, their purpose can't really be served by mine because uh, my direction is a little bit different. And sometimes it causes uh, staff a little bit of discomfort, you know, having to work with them. And, I, and I, to me, it's more important to look at the long game than really that short-term game. So often I, I will you know, 
have to exit a client because they just don't simply uh, align with where we're going and 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 uh, they're not making things uh, uh, you know uh, the way I had created which is to inspire other people to try to do good in this world how does that impact like overall you know in the beginning when I uh, you know set out this uh, uh, company and said oh we're only going to work with impact companies uh, I thought it would actually reduce the number of uh, companies that would come on as accounts uh, what I found was it really to be the opposite and, you know m- much to my happiness in, th- in that way part of me was looking for a way to taper off and <laughs> retire a little bit so that I could mm-hmm. spend a little bit less time in the trenches what I began finding was there were more and more people simply looking for that same alignment. And it's surprising what's out there. I think when you try to blast and try to get everybody on side, you're just spread a little bit too thin and you can't really capture who you are. When you're able to articulate truly what you're all about and the reason why you exist, then other people can begin to align with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. At, at what point would a company, you know, hire you? You know, I, I think, you know, we have lots of conversations, you know, around like marketing. It's like, oh, you need a marketer, blah, 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 blah. You know, but branding, I think, I think um, doesn't appear to have, you know, that return on investment. Marketing, we're driving leads, you know, but branding, mm-hmm. we are, you know, what, what, is, what is that value for the company? And, and again, I mean, when, when do companies typically say, hey, you know what, I need to bring in the brand guy? Yeah, you know, the uh, the best time is really at the beginning when you're trying to shape your product or service or trying to shape the company itself. I've been involved uh, with many companies midstream. Uh, I've been involved with companies that, you know, suddenly feel they need to... um, you know, overhaul their brand because they're, they plan to put themselves up for sale in a few years. And I've been in many of those situations that, you know, at, at that point, I began realizing that the brand part of it has a huge impact on it because it, it helps to shape public perception. It helps to shape really that manner in which you are all about. And while you can't uh, maybe directly have an ROI, you what you can do is have a um, a type of brand that people can respond to well, and that part can be monetized. And you know, I've had a number of companies say to me, you know, without this, uh, uh, I don't think we could have got the price that we uh, did for the sale of the company. So they, they've attributed as much as 25% to <laughs> value to the company just based on the brand itself. And, then, and that's uh, phenomenal, but not unexpected at the same time, because brand is what helps distinguish you in the marketplace. And if you do the job right, and it isn't simply just a logo or a visual uh, manifestation of what you're all about, really what it is, is uh, having uh, people understand what you're all about and being able to connect to it. And when you have that connection, that's really what the brand is all about. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So uh, what's the difference between, I'm laughing because I've, I've done this, what's the difference between like developing your own brand internally and working with you? I think it's that uh, outside perspective that can often uh, shed light on, on who you are. Um, and, but it, it is okay to do it yourself. The only thing I would advise people looking to uh, create their personal brand is also get input from other people because we have a yeah. very one-dimensional view of ourselves and it could be uh, maybe underwhelming we may not be as confident in how we see ourselves or the opposite we may see ourselves as much bigger than what we are or only a small part of it when you get that outside perspective as you're open to it whether it's through uh, you know personality tests assessments whether it's through uh, people just simply providing some input it gives you an overview and you know those who are particularly good and very Um, emotionally, let's say empathetic, can often determine how they're being perceived by people, even within a a short time in in a meeting. Taking that further, of course, if you understand how you fit in the marketplace, then you can begin to either adjust, you know, to align to who you really want to be or find a way to bring this best part of you uh, to light. Because in the end, it it really is only one aspect that that you're showing to the world. And the better that you can bring it to people, then uh, obviously the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know one of the things I've struggled with, and I've, I've seen it, like, historically, um, and I've seen a lot of companies struggle with, is is, is telling that story, you know? I think mm-hmm. I, so, so, you know, go to these networking events, um, and they're like, what do you do? It's like, oh, I'm an operations consultant. I help companies, blah, 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 blah. I, and it, it was, you know, thinking back, you know, it was, it was absolutely horrible. You know, you see people's, like, eyes glaze over, you know, yada, yada. Um, and, you know, I, I, um, like... 
I've seen, especially uh, like software and that sort of thing, where mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, our software does this, 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 and they're and they're telling this story about you know these these features and that sort of thing, and it's like, how, how do you get past that? You know, how do you, how do you get a real understanding of what your company is really about, what that story is? Yeah, you know, I, I think you, you those are perfect examples, uh, particularly in a network setting, because in that network setting, uh, often uh, many of the people may not, in fact, be your target market to uh, begin with. So part of, you know, doing that is, is sussing them out, doing that little bit of filtering to determine how deep you can go with your story. So there yeah. are things we work with and we think of in, in terms of threes. So. What, you know, how do you describe yourself maybe in three seconds, which is often one word, right, to get people hooked? How do I describe myself in 30 seconds, right, which is a little bit longer of a story? And how do I describe myself in three minutes? So we can imagine in the beginning what you're really trying to do is simply get across that one word or that three-second story to people. If they're interested, you go a little bit deeper, and I can tell you a little bit more. Beyond that, then uh, how do you go to the longer story? And, and most people aren't interested in it, but the ones who are will spend time with you, and that allows you to get into that three-minute story at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I've, I've, I've heard the the um, and and maybe this is the approach, but I've, I've heard the approach where you know you you tell the big story, and then you reduce it. Okay, let's take this. Okay, you got three minutes. All right, let's you know get it down to one minute. All right, let's get it to thirty mm-hmm. seconds. Let's get it down to you know, two or three words. Is, is that kind of the approach you take or do you take more of the, the opposite approach? Yeah, so imagine almost like two funnels coming together at a point. So we do a lot of work uh, because often people will have a very wide story and there's a lot of information. So you start off wide and you begin to filter and filter and filter down. I do this exercise where we try to uh, have yourself expressed in six words. Because if you think of a billboard, for example, you're driving along a freeway, uh, you have maybe a few seconds to take it in. The most you can typically bring in is about six, seven words. So uh, one of the exercises I, I do with uh, people is, uh, is actually inspired by Ernest Hemingway, because uh, apparently as, as the story goes, he was in a bar in Havana and he bet the guy mm-hmm. next to him that he could write a short story in six words. And he said, the other guy said, I'll, I'll take that bet and over a tequila. So on a little napkin, apparently he writes baby shoes for sale, never worn. And it was a beautiful story where you begin to put in your own thoughts and theater of the mind. But it was a wonderful way of capturing it. And uh, if you think of that approach, those few words are really just the beginning because you want to, okay, well, where did those baby shoes come from? How did that happen? Why are they, you know? And so you're doing the same sort of thing where you're trying to express enough about yourself to get people intrigued. So you begin the conversation because really a story is a a little bit more than just a simple monologue, but hopefully a conduit to some back and forth engagement and a conversation with people. So what we do with that is begin even distilling it further, saying you begin to own one single word. You know? So if I say the word Volvo, you know, which has a reputation for one word, which was safety, of course. When I say Nike, you think of winning. When I say Apple, you think of innovation. So all those major great brands have distilled themselves down to a single word. And people can do this as well. You know? And if we were working together, Rick, not that you need help with your brand, Rick, but you know, in that brief conversation, I, I really got to that point where uh, you know, I, my hypothesis would have been that your word would have been around helping people or help of some sort. So you begin building from that. So once you have that one word, now you begin to re-expand it because it's not all that big story that you shared in the beginning, but using yeah. that as almost the moral of the story, how do you build it out so I can sh- support and begin to tell a tale around it? How do I bring that to life and visually? How do I exact it in my social media? How do I bring it to any sort of advertising or that yeah. sign on, on the wall, for example? Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. I like that approach. I know. I know. With um, you know, sometimes when I'm when I'm working on different projects, you know, it's it's mm-hmm. literally um, I'm doing something just like Eureka, you know, and I stop and just mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, let, let me write this down. And it's kind of that approach, though, you know, because it's it's like it's almost like you know, random brainstorming, but you know, like you're saying, just kind of distilling it down, and then you know, being able to rebuild it into, into something that you know is is you know somewhat cohesive, and then redoing it again but yeah it's I, the, the thing that the thing that and you know i i, th- I think it has to be done but you know it, it sounds like work 
you know, it sounds mm-hmm. like you know, we go into a room with executives or whomever, and like, okay, guys, we are going to refine this brand, or we're going to create a brand, or you know, whatever that is. I mean, what what is it? You've you've, you've told us some of the some of the some of the tactics and that sort of thing, but I mean, what is what is that experience like? I think part of it, and then the uh, beauty of these uh, workshops that you've described is to actually begin to align people. Because many of the companies I work with, their, their brand may have been in existence for you know decades, and it's right. maybe moved off a little of the path. And often the leader of the company says, "We we need to get people uh, you know thinking the same thing," because you, yeah. your uh, brand is often manifested by its weakest link. You could have this wonderful brand of helpful service, for example, but you could have a very bad experience at the retail level or the customer service level and your brand begins to uh, fall apart so sometimes yeah. the work i do is to help realign people with it and uh, often it, uh, what happens is m- many times the you know, people are telling the story all differently so bringing everybody into the same room you know doing some of this exercise we begin to align and get people thinking the same way you know when you can again bring it down to that single set of words or that single word and people can get behind it now they begin to understand it now they begin to know how to interpret it and bring it to life of course and they share their version of the story but in the end it becomes the same sort of thing i love it i love it i love it one of the other things i was thinking is um and talk i mentioned it you know early on um you know with a personal brand it's like sometimes when you develop that personal brand you know while it's authentically you perhaps you weren't acting that out you know, perhaps you were a little bit conservative or whatever. You weren't really mm-hmm. living that out. Comes to mind is is with a business. And so when we're looking at a company, you know, they've created their brand. I imagine there are going to be operational changes, you know, that may take place as a result of this is what we do, this is who we serve, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that, is that your experience? Yeah, often that is the case because you still need to operationalize it to uh, your point, Rick. And, and that's like, how, how do you bring that to life? How do I, uh, you know, do the road show to inform everybody at the same time? And this is often yeah. where, uh, you know, the weak spots begin to appear within the company because sometimes you're at cross purposes with the, the people who uh, may not understand the brand or they have their own motivation for why they're doing things or, you know, or this is the way I do things. And this is where that uh, misalignment begins to show itself. And, and, and often, you know, company leaders will take a very hard look at those people because a, a, a successful company, as you can imagine, is where all people are rowing in the same direction. They're all rowing in synchronicity. And if it doesn't happen, then, uh, you know, that, that's where some uh, adjustment needs to be made. And it, it could simply be uh, having people understand what you're really a, about again, you know, and, and that's where that purpose and, and why you exist. Uh, and again, if, they, if they're not aligned to it, maybe they're, you know, maybe a, a harder, harsher look at uh, that, that fit of the person, of course. But by and large, you know, I think people are looking uh, to be led. They're looking for a direction to go. And then that's really the, the goal of the uh, company leader and why they exist, of course. How do, how do you hold that team um, accountable? You know, I mean, we've done we've done the work. You know, we're promoting it. You know, internal pr- promoting it externally. How do you hold the team accountable, and and how do you even hold the the leadership accountable? You know, a lot of times, you know, we we see you know these exercises, and the leader is like you know out of alignment sometimes. You know, mm-hmm. he's preaching it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but, or, or, or they end up going off course in, in the middle of uh, execute, execution. Uh, so a lot of yeah. it really begins how committed they are to it and, what, and how important uh, this brand mission may be for them. So it, it often means uh, check-ins. It often means uh, assessments during uh, different points. Many uh, yeah. large companies, you can imagine, have what they refer to as a chief brand officer. And that isn't okay. simply a title, fancy uh, title for you know all things that are related related to logos or related to the high profile brand itself, it really has to permeate through the company. And that's where uh, it is particularly important to have you lieutenants uh, be able to exact the brand and understand it. And it, you go back to the uh, days of apostles, let's say, you know, people who really are able to take that 
common word for it and be able to share it with people and inspire people Mm -hmm. because you obviously can't do it alone but if you have enough people who are your emissaries and can represent the brand and this is even true in in consumer land you know your consumer sometimes becomes your best advocates for your brand because they embrace it and they believe what it believe in you know there was a situation years ago and you may recall this where uh, gap was trying to change their brand their logo and they came out with a new uh, logo and people got so upset. They were writing petition letters. They were sending nasty notes. It was, you know, just before social media really took off. But the point was still made that this is not no longer your brand, but <laughs> our brand. And you've gone off course and we're going to try to correct it. So Gap listened to that, of course, and brought the old logo back. And it's stayed ever since that. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love that. What's a great brand turnaround story um, that you could share? You know, I I think uh, you see this a lot in car companies, of course, you know, uh, companies that, you know, begin to lose their luster and and they get reinvigorated. A classic example uh, over the years is, you know, Jaguar, for example, as a car for many years, uh, or even Mm -hmm. another one, Mercedes, both of them are very similar in in their story, you know, had become that sort of older um, white gentleman's car, you know, something that people didn't necessarily aspire to, but if you had money, you would have it, but you would often be frowned upon by realigning the brand by standing for slightly different aspects of what they are, which is a little bit more that fun uh, exhilaration, that embracing of life and that uh, both Mercedes and Jaguar were able to take, capture not only a new audience, but be, be able to reshape their brand so they became aspirational again. That's a wonderful turnaround brand when you're able to bring it back to the, what you represented in the beginning. And, and that happens a lot to many brands. They get very comfortable where they are and uh, mm-hmm. uh, without shaking things up a little bit, it becomes a little bit stayed, a little bit stale, and uh, people don't gravitate to it again. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what came to mind, um, I guess, also also in the auto industry is, um, and I help her get the brand right, um, Kia, you know, when it first came mm-hmm. out, you know, it was you know, yeah. cheap, affordable vehicle, and then now you look exactly. on the road, like, wow, that's, that's a Kia, that, that, that's an awesome looking vehicle. Is, is that like a, a, do you feel like that was a strategy that they had from inception, or is that just them adapting to the American market, or... You know, I, I, I don't know what went on behind uh, the scenes, but uh, in, done correctly, uh, part of the goal would have been to, you know, we need to, uh, you know, position ourselves as a, being a little bit more futuristic or a little bit more contemporary. So how do we yeah. manifest ourselves? So that's where the design uh, part comes in. And, and we know from uh, many cases and, and other brands like Apple, for example, uh, reinvigorated themselves and became aspirational. You know, the, the tale of uh, where Apple went, they ended up being beige boxes while when Steve Jobs wasn't there, when he came back, he reinvigorated things. But again, it was a manifestation of his vision and, and manifestation of his design ethics, uh, aesthetics as, as well. So with that, you can really bring a lot to life and, and we can't ignore the power of design and what it means. So, so a logo may not be able to motivate people, but a wow, a well-designed product and a well sort of uh, presented product can make a world of difference. Yeah, yeah. I, I often say to my team, you know, what, what, are we, you know, what are we known for? What do we want to be known for? You know, and it's, it's like from there that allows us to, you know, look at it you know, look from an innovative perspective, you know, what do we want to develop? What do we want the customer story to be like, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is that a typical approach or do people take, do companies take different approaches to, to developing their brand? Yeah, I think it depends on how it's acted upon, for example. So we could often uh, have an exercise and, and I've seen this be the folly of many companies where they, uh, let's say, try to write a mission statement together, meaning that yeah. everybody inputs on it. So they get a chance to have a, a bit of the phrase or their keywords and you try to make it democratic. And so it becomes yeah. a, a conglomeration of everybody's thoughts. But what it lacks is maybe that clear direction. You really need yeah. to be solo in that way. Here's, as the company leader, here's what I, I believe in, and I hope you do as well, because this is why we exist. How yeah. will you help me bring it to life is really perhaps the question as opposed to how do you see where the company is going. 
So if you set something out and people understand what the goal is and where the goalposts are, they'll play their heart out, hopefully, to help you reach that, of course. I love that. I love that. That's, um, you know, I think that was one of the thoughts I had in the back of my brain because, you know, I've done the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the democratic mission development. And, you know, yeah. I, I remember looking back and just thinking, it's like, I, I, you know, I don't know if they're going to own it. And, and that's always been my fear. And, and I try not to, I guess, guide people, you know, I've, you know, historically, I've tried not to guide people in that, but it's, it's like, you know, I can't, create your mission for you. I can't create your vision for you. I can, you know, kind of me personally, you can do it. I'm sure. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But you know, it's like that leader has to own that, like you we were saying, and then, you know, get everybody else in alignment. And, and I've seen where companies have done that um, company um, just comes to mind right now. And, and like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is the direction that we're going in, you know, and it becomes a choice, you know, for the for the team. You know, they decide whether yeah. or not you know, the direction the company is going, and because they have a clear picture of that, you know, they get to decide whether or not this is where they want to be. You know, yeah. so I, I think it's exactly, great. and I think that that's uh, fundamental. You know, I uh, met um, uh, Ryan Scudamore years ago. He's the uh, founder of one a wonderful mm-hmm. success story of uh, you know garbage hauling, and he shared yeah. this story with me where. He, he was running a successful business and he had, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, just under 50 employees at that time, lots of mm-hmm. trucks and uh, they were doing a good business, but everybody was doing things differently than how he wanted. And it was mm-hmm. a very difficult thing, but it was the right thing he did. And he came in one day, he told me and said, uh, I'm closing the company down. It's not going the direction I, I want. And what he did was he ended up firing everybody and restarting the company with his mission in place. His goal was to be the, you know, the gentlest, most kindest uh, uh, service provider. His goal was to end up on Oprah. You know, his goal was to do good uh, with the money he was going to make. His whole paint paint a picture, as you described it, had a very different picture than everybody else. But once he set that out, he was able to bring people on who had the same vision, you know, and they would go to the nth degree for him. And that's a benefit of being able to set it out rather than simply to have other people tell you how, where the company should go, because they, they're in a way uh, being paid and which is great. But uh, yeah. what is the thing that goes beyond that uh, paycheck itself? What drives them? Yeah. And if those motives align, then you have people who will stay with you forever, who will yeah. simply be the best that they can because the missions align. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. So, Henry, you, you wrote a book. You want to talk about that mm-hmm. real quick? Yeah, so I think it is a, a summation of a lot of things I've talked about today. Uh, it actually came out of COVID when a lot of us were in lockdown. I had a little bit more time on my hand than uh, other people uh, for a brief period of time. So I began documenting a lot of the process and I, you know, things that I often use with my clients. So it became a page by page, chapter by chapter approach to uh, yeah. bringing your brand to life and, you know, figuring out your story and how to tell it and uh, being able to manifest it in the, in the marketplace. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a hopefully a helpful guide. Uh, I was finding there were also a number of people who would come to me to try to create their brand on, on you know, as they were building their careers. And, you know, the unfortunate mm-hmm. part with a lot of consultancies is not everyone can afford your fees. Um, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I want to make this information accessible to people, hence the, uh, the book itself. Awesome, awesome. Does it include like uh, tools and that sort of thing? Or is it yeah, the little exercises as, as you go through it. Uh, the most important thing, if there's anything that we can take away even from today's discussion, is really to be able to understand your story and how to tell it. Because uh, through that story, it, it's really a medium by which you can get people aligned to where you're going and what your mission is all about. And hopefully they'll join you uh, for that ride at the same time. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about what you're doing and, and you know, get your book, I mean, how do they do that? Uh, you know, I have a very uh, simple website, henrywong.co, and my book's on the site, uh, my contact information. Love to always connect with people. So very much looking forward to anyone who uh, is happy to reach out. Awesome, awesome. And, and you're on LinkedIn as well, right? LinkedIn as well, yeah. 
Okay, cool, cool. And what we'll do is we'll put uh, the links on the show notes so anybody that uh, listens or watches the show, they can certainly uh, reach out to you. Great. Any words mm-hmm. of wisdom before we take, we call it a day? You know, I, I think uh, I always think of what we talked about in the beginning, and that is being uh, true to yourself. Uh, I often think of that Shakespeare line, uh, to thine own self be true. And I think it's very important for people to stay true to uh, themselves as they navigate their success. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I am completely aligned with that. That's perfect. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. Henry, thank you thank so much for joining us today. This has been oh, fantastic. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I really enjoyed my time here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, folks, we have completed another episode of the Relentless Pursuit of Winning Podcast. We'll catch you next time.